Making headlines tonight. Stiffer penalties coming for gun crimes. Police reporting success in dealing with illegal firearms. Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley welcomes new investment into the world acclaimed Cliff Restaurant. And coming up in sports, rain washes out play today in two key fixtures at the ICC T20 World Cup. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. I'm Shane Jones, leading the news at 7. Local authorities are getting much tougher on gun crimes. New legislation being proposed could lead to life imprisonment for people found guilty of committing more than one offense. Shane Seeley joins us live now from the new center in his Commemor tie. Up and on, Shane, with more details about those changes. Yes, up and on, Shane, and I can tell you this firearms bill was introduced in the House of Assembly by the Attorney General, Dale Marshall. Under the proposed bill, an individual found guilty of a first offense could face anywhere between 10 and 20 years behind bars. Subsequent offenses will attract no fewer than 20 years imprisonment. We can't predict how a jury will rule, okay? So you may get off of murder. But he could find himself, if this is a second offense, staring a life sentence in the face because he could be convicted of the firearm offense. So you may get away, you may get off a murder charge on a technicality, all kind of thing. The jury may not believe that it was murder. But if you do it with a firearm and it was a second firearm offense, you can find yourself staring a life penalty, a life sentence in the face. Much as if you were convicted of murder, but didn't receive capital punishment. The Attorney General explains there will be some instances when the judge can exercise his discretion and impose a lesser sentence. He has also revealed prison sentences imposed under the Act must be served consecutively to any other sentence to which the individual is subject to at that time. Normally, you, go, you get sent, you, you, you're found guilty of, of a dozen things, and the court looks at the overall circumstances and so on, and then they give, you, they give you, they say, well, for this, you get three years. For that, you get six years. For the next thing, you get that, but you end up only serving the longest of the time. Not so anymore with firearm offenses, Mr. Speaker. We add in the two together. You are man enough. You are man enough to commit two offenses will feel two sets of punishment. The bill also amends the definition of imitation firearms. The Home Affairs Minister Wilfred Abrams explains the term now covers anything that appears to be a firearm, whether or not it is capable of discharging shots. So you use it in the commission of an offense then you can be charged under the firearm act as if what you were actually holding in your hand was a firearm. So people need to understand that. It is a fear that you cause to other people. Because if I pull a gun from my waist and point at somebody and try to rob them, or I pull a piece of wood that is cut in the shape of a gun and try to rob them, and that person turns and runs across the road and gets knocked down by a car, it doesn't matter that it was not a gun. Right? It is what fear or what did they actually interpret that my actions were capable of causing. Now, Shane, a very disturbing story has been revealed on the floor of Parliament during this debate. An MP revealing being threatened by a gang member demanding money. The Minister of State in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Dr. Sonia Brown, shed some light on what happened to her in her contribution to the Firearms Amendment Act 2022, as she called for more support for police on and off duty. One of the gang members called me and demanded money, and I was scared stiff for a week. I mean, I reported it to the police. Well, all my windows are glass and a bullet, because stand up to glass is not bulletproof. And I had to put an invention there. I had the, 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 the fear of knowing that two people came in my yard at night to see how best they can get in. So imagine a police officer that sees these people every day, and then the are undercover in Barbados. They know the faces. Make sure the, the police officers are equipped to protect themselves and their families along with us. That is very, very important. 
Now, earlier in the debate, the Minister of State in the Attorney General's office with responsibility for crime prevention, Corey Lane, he's proposing a zero-tolerance attitude to what may be seen as minor infractions. He believes Barbadians are too tolerant of small crimes. We are very tolerant with the wheelies on the streets. We are very tolerant with people breaking lights, bright lights in this country. And sir, it only starts there. But then it manifests itself into greater things. So I believe that Barbados needs its own crack paint or a, a shirt, tail, program, whatever you want to call it. Because one of the things that we have to realize is that as school is the primary, one of the primary socialization institutions in the country. When you have students walking up and down the road, shirt tails out, swearing like them in the fish market, it starts there. And we got to be serious even about those things to send a message that we can get serious about the small things before they become big things. Well, Shane, that's it from the floor of Parliament. It's back over to you. Up and on. Up and on, Shane. Thanks a lot. Well, the word from Acting Commissioner of Police, Erin Boyce, says as Barbados approaches the Yuletide season, Acting Assistant Commissioner of Police, David Griffith, says while crime has increased by 4%, lawmen have been able to solve a number of cases. We have recorded 35 murders. 26 of those 35 murders were committed by the use of firearm. But we have made some inroads. We have arrested 24 persons in connection with those 35 murders. When we look at the firearm cases, 10 of the 26 firearm cases were solved, resulting in 13 persons being charged and placed before the court. And in one particular case, one individual was charged in relation to two murders. And when we look at our firearm, related cases, including murder, possession of firearm, and ammunition, use of firearm, endangering life, and aggravated burglary by the use of firearm. A total of 156 persons were charged and placed before the court in relation to those matters. However, Acting Commissioner Boyce acknowledges recidivism is straining police resources and remains a concern, which is why the Barbados Police Service is rolling out its post-charge strategy. Is at the court, you can get bail or you can be remanded. And sometimes there are prolific uh, offenders, priority offenders, where we are concerned that require us to keep an eye out for them. And, and this is where the post-strategy, post-charge strategy come into play. We will follow the case. We will follow the, the activities of the individual. Take the world-acclaimed Cliff Restaurant has reopened with Prime Minister Mia Moore Motley welcoming the investment by owner Michael Kent in the St. James business and other restaurants. She thanked him for the confidence shown in Barbados, noting those who become Bajans by choice are some of the most passionate and are making a definable difference. The Prime Minister is encouraging Barbadians to understand that tourism is our business and we must play our part to give visitors the experience of their life. Though being vital to Barbados, she says the island will not make it purely on the sun, sea and sand brand, but notes the other products added to the mix are also important. But it's the other things that we add to the equation that will make the defining difference in whether people want to continue to come over and over and over again. And therefore, the ability to offer fine dining at a very, very high level the ability to have other attractions which make people want to be able to do things such that they don't feel as though they're bored. The ability to have the public infrastructure that allows them to do the work that they may need to do while still connecting, while being here on the beach or while being here enjoying themselves but connecting with back home. We are a global destination. Our difficulties over the last few years should not constrain our ambition and should not cause us to feel that we cannot make it again. Mr. Kent admits he never planned to get into the restaurant business, but his love for Barbados and welcoming spirit of Barbadians enticed him. 
these restaurants have been closed and uh, uh, we were delighted to get in them because we're in Barbados. It's a wonderful place to do such a thing. The setting here, particularly the cliff, is amazing how this was set out to start set up to start with and what a place to be. The the whole atmosphere as you'll see in the evening it, it, is stunning. Uh, what we've done by recruiting the very best staff. Uh, we employ about 330 people in the three restaurants. Yeah. Uh, about three, 310 locals. Barbadians have another opportunity to discuss changes to the Constitution when the Constitutional Reform and Commission hosts Reform Commission hosts a public meeting this Sunday, October 30th, at the Alexandra School in St. Peter. Joining us live to speak about the meeting is a member of the Commission, Carrie Ann Eiffel. Good evening, Ms. Eiffel. Good evening, Shane. Up and on. Up and on. Uh, tell us a bit more about the upcoming meeting and why Barbadians should participate in these discussions on constitutional reform. This Sunday evening, we will have our second town hall in a series of three. These three are general town halls where Barbadians are invited to come and share their views on specific, on any area really that they feel they need to air their views on. We want as many persons as possible to come out five to seven on Sunday evening at the Alexandra School. We're touching the various areas in Barbados. We did St. Michael's School before. We're doing Alexandra this weekend. And then we'll do the Dighton Griffith School on the third weekend. And this is at the start of some other public engagements because this is our constitution, not the commission, not the attorney general, but this is Barbados's constitution we're talking about. And so we invite everyone to come out and share their views. And if you can't be there in person, you can follow us on YouTube, on the various government channels, on the various pages, so that you can see what we're talking about and weigh in with your comments. We will, of course, have sign language interpreting because, like I said, it's all Barbadians. So we're being as inclusive as we possibly can. Uh, from the submissions that you've already received, um, what are the particular areas Barbadians want to address? What have you been seeing rec rec recurring? The reoccurring decimal across the border, I have to say, is they want to see more accountability, transparency, and governance in our country. How Barbadians themselves, how the common man, how the public can have a greater level of involvement at the level of governance with across Barbados. That's what we're trying to see. That's what we're seeing in all the various submissions, which come in, in a variety of media. Okay. And, and how serious are these proposals being taken from, from the public? Oh, they are being taken extremely seriously. The commission, chaired by retired Justice Christopher Blackman, and with the other commissioners that we have, we sift through all of the submissions. We are engaging with our stakeholders. We've written to several entities across Barbados, inviting them to comment, to sending what their opinions are, what their views are on constitutional reform. And we are having public lectures. We're just going to start a whole cadre of activities. Our webpage, went live this week. We have a hotline for persons to call and we are making it very possible for persons to share their views because this is our constitution as I just said and so we are taking these submissions extremely seriously as we get down to the serious work of delivering the constitution that we all deserve. And before I let you go, um, can you give us that web page in the hotline? The web page is crcbarbados.com and the hotline is 535-1250. Thank you so much, Ms. Eiffel. You're welcome. That was a member of the Constitutional Reform Commission, Carrie Ann Eiffel. Coming up after the break, local pediatricians worried about the impact of a respiratory virus. A prediction from a leading pediatrician. More children will be affected by respiratory virus RSV once it reaches our shores. That's why Dr. Clyde Cave is urging parents and guardians to be vigilant, especially during this flu season. The virus has taken its toll on children in the USA, and Dr. Cave explains why it could be more infectious and cause more sickness here in Barbados this time around than it did pre-pandemic. RSV, which is a virus that affects young children and their lungs, is something that is constantly in circulation. It tends to be seasonal. 
in North America. And when you have open borders and tourists being welcomed to our country, you know, there's a natural transmission of the virus. And it's believed that most children will have picked this up and gotten immune to it by the time they're three or four years. Now, with people being isolated for a few years, instead of just having a vulnerable population of under two-year-olds, we also have those three- and four-year-olds who are not exposed to the virus. So we have a population that's easily doubled or troubled who are susceptible to this virus. Now, for most children, this virus will be like a cold. The Food and Rum Festival went into high gear last night with Oystens Under the Stars. Our Crystal Hoyt was there and filed this report. It was food, rum and culture at Barbados' premier fishing village, Oystens in Christchurch, as the Food and Rum Festival officially began. We customarily kick off in Oystens and we wanted to keep that. So while we added a number of new events this year, it was really important for us to stay true to our roots and stay true to the story of food and rum in Barbados. And you can't talk about food in Barbados and, you know, experiences of really showcasing what we have to offer without showing people Oystens. Um, there are people who are from this town and they never left. And so anytime somebody comes to the island and they want to have a unique experience, we send them to Oystens. The theme of this year's festival is Feed the Future, and among activities supporting this concept was last night's live cooking demo by award-winning Barbadian chef Craig Greenwich and two upcoming chefs. I love to see the youngsters and the younger chefs coming up to get more involved so they can also push their self individual as a chef. Even though they're working in the business, they can start other businesses through Food and Rum Festival Barbados because they come and they cater just the us caterers for the 500, for the thousands and that kind of stuff. I mean, it creates positive momentum for all of us. And then obviously with the students coming on and helping us, they get to interact with us, build their confidence, and they learn a, a lot of self-presentation and open skills. Anne Burrell, one of five international chefs who will be a part of this year's Food and Rum, joined the group on stage. This event tonight at Oysters is always my favorite, favorite event of the festival because it's like you come out, everybody is just like, hey, hey, hi, how are you doing? And it feels like a family, whether you're from here, whether you're a tourist, everybody mixes so beautifully and happily. And then we have delicious food, of which my belly is nicely full. Outside of the cooking demo, there were many vendors, entertainment, and even more patrons happy for the return of the festival after two years. It feels so good. Um, food is really like my element. It's what I enjoy. It's what I'm the most passionate about. So to be able to come out here and experience food and rum and our culture with so many people together again, not having to wear masks, not having to be too distant, and just enjoying the festival, just feels really, really good. The Food and Rum Festival continues this weekend. Crystal Hoyt. CBC News. Thanks, Crystal. A young Barbadian, just nine years old, will be flipping the switch at this year's Sajakor lighting ceremony to signal the launch of celebrations for the 56th anniversary of independence here in Barbados. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Community Empowerment, Yolande Howard, made the announcement during a media briefing, giving details on plans for this year's event. She recognized the international sporting achievements of national athletes Shade Williams, Jonathan Jones and Shane Brathwick. Ms. Howard, however, explained why the decision was made to go with a developing athlete rather than an elite athlete. The whole purpose of having an iconic person um, flick the lights at the lighting ceremony has been really to show that we have people in our country who have skills and who have talents and we need to be able to showcase them. We have sought though to identify a developing athlete as opposed to an elite athlete. A young person, a young Barbadian citizen, one who should we, we should be proud of and who has demonstrated at a young age that she has the potential to be an international swimmer. Nine years old, nine years old, and already she's won national medals and she's won medals at the Goodwill Games. 
We are also being told that over the next three years, Sajakor will be rolling out what it calls the Community Wellness Project. General Manager and Vice President Paul Innes says it's part of the company's continued support, not only for the lighting ceremony, but for the country as a whole. The emphasis of that project is really to go into every parish and the communities within that parish, those parishes, and connect with those people who actually made Sajikor what it is to be. Sajikor has been around for 182 years. It is now a global company, but the beginnings of Sajikor came from humble Barbados, and our forefathers, our great-great-grandparents, actually built a company called Mutual, which is now Sajikor and Sajikor has established itself as a global company operating in North America and across uh, the English and Spanish-speaking Caribbean. There's a call for all workers to recommit to their unions given the threat the trade union movement is facing. It has come from President of the Barbados Union of Teachers, Rudy Lovell. He was speaking at the launch of a new logo for the teachers' union. Mr. Lovell says all-out war is being waged to deny workers their right of association. Trade unions are constantly under threat, and workers need to commit, recommit to their unions. This is essential because some employers continue to do everything possible to frustrate workers and their representatives. Given this, workers need to rally around the mantra, there is strength in numbers, by supporting their trade union or joining one. Among other things, joining their trade union allows for issues of concern to workers to be easily addressed. The rationale behind the new logo, which was created during the COVID pandemic, has been explained by Public Relations Officer Marsha Burke. Our union has grown and evolved over the last 48 years, and we felt it was time for a change. We have refreshed our logo to reflect who we are today and to symbolize our future. After careful considerations, we chose a new logo that reflects a more modern look while maintaining the aspects of the original version. The outline of the map of Barbados, and you can see it here on my right, was maintained. However, the new design is a cl close resemblance to the original map of Barbados. The letters B-U-T are still contained within the outline. Within the outline. However, they are now in a 3D format so that they are more distinct within the logo. Sports time now, and we head over to the sports studio and say a very good evening to Damien Best. Yeah, good evening to you, Shane. Good evening to our viewers and listeners. Well, professional boxing in Barbados is on pause, and boxing promoter Sam Lane is urging the Ministry of Sports to urgently look at re-establishing a local boxing board. That board will have the authority to grant permission for professional fights and issue licenses to professional boxers. Lane says he has athletes ready to get into the ring again following a long layoff due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I am eagerly awaiting the, the appointment of the new Boxing Board of Control, who is the authority, the legal authority to um, run professional boxing in Barbados and amateur boxing. Uh, we had, the guys have been able to shoot COVID and now through the lack of uh, properly functioning boxing board to put on the show. We have guys who have been training for the past year, and these are Miguel Antoine, former former world rated and Commonwealth champion, uh, former amateur bronze medalist Anderson Emmanuel, and three-time Caribbean amateur champion Ricardo Blackman Jr. Uh, so we're eagerly anticipating the appointment of the board so we can have a series of votes which are planned from now till the end of next year. Lane also says plans are on the table for a boxing card at the Boscobel Community Centre in St. Peter at the end of November. First one being the last Saturday in November as an independent gift to Barbados. And the next one should be the end of December around Boxing Day, which we hope to have were rated Kobe Brady, who's based in Las Vegas right now with his management team, Seymour, Floyd Seymour. And, you know, boxing looks to be up and up, but we need to remove the obstacles that have been restricting 
professional boxing in Barbados. It's time that we have a properly functioning boxing board. Some basketball news now. Barbados Community College continue their winning ways in the National Sports Council's Under-19 Basketball Tournament. Playing at the BCC gym, the hosts were just too much for the inexperienced Dayton Griffith team, winning 90-19. to Under-19 Basketball, Dayton Griffith School up against host Barbados Community College. A very tough assignment for the boys in black, and it showed that's two of the 50 points scored by BCC in the first half. Michael Watts was among five players in double figures for BCC. Got a close-up look at the hoop. Money shot plus the foul had 12 points. Dayton only scored nine points across two quarters. So let's hope the second half is more competitive. Not by this evidence, just too easy. They were guilty of not moving the ball and the BCC players were just picking off the attempted passes to Cody Aline with the layup. One of three players reporting 10 points. A huge learning curve for Dayton. Only one point scored in the third quarter. Fall before the pass, Devontae Headley with an opportunity at the line. Sinks the first and misses the second. Getting their zone defense to work will be one of the keys to development for Dayton. And as you can see, BCC were just having free reign around the defenders. O.J. Wharton was the only bright spark for the Kingsland boys. Cleans up the miss. Scored a team high 12 points. However, BCC poured in 17 points in the third and 23 more in the fourth quarter, meaning this game was a complete blowout as they register the 90 to 19 victory over Dayton Griffith. Tonight's business report is brought to you by the City of Bridgetown Cooperative Credit Union Limited. Measuring success one member at a time. Barbadians are being told now is a good time to invest in a photovoltaic system. The advice from government's chief energy conservation and renewable energy officer William Hines as he discussed renewable energy at the seventh and final town hall meeting at the Abundant Life Church yesterday. In 1977, that was not the time because it was very expensive. But the price of the solar system has reduced 400 times since 1977. You can see in this graph that it has really dropped. That's one reason. The second reason is that we now have a regulator who tells the utility that they must buy any electricity that you sell at a good price. So it's cheaper to invest and know you're selling it at a good price. You're selling the electricity at a good price. Minister of the Minister of Finance, Ryan Strong, says businesses are still trying to come to grips with issues caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Among them, he says, are shipping challenges. The minister was delivering remarks during a ceremony at the Watton Community Centre last night as Supreme Distributors presented football gear and equipment to the Watton Football Club. The minister, who is also the Member of Parliament for Christchurch East Central, says adjustments have to be made to doing business and congratulated Corporate Barbados for its assistance. We've all had challenges with shipping and a whole range of things. And to the extent that we're here today, um, I'm happy that we've been able to endure because we've all had to make significant changes to what we do, how we do it. And I think that it is commendable that your company is still very willing to be able to provide the support at this time, particularly given the impact that it's had financially on all of us. Time to head back on over to the sports studio for the second half in sports of Damien. Thanks so much, Shane. Well, new lights will soon be installed at the Watton playing field in Christchurch. Word of this from Minister in the Ministry of Finance and Member of Parliament for Christchurch East Central, Ryan Strawn. He was speaking after footballers from the area received equipment and Van Pure branded gear from Supreme Distributors in a ceremony at the Watton Community Centre. He thanked the company for its assistance and gave some advice to the team who've made it through to the quarterfinals of the BFA's Republic Cup competition. You've been training in some extraordinary circumstances. 
and the extent to which obviously the field is not yet um, um, lit, a number of polls have, have, have fallen down. Um, have committed to following up with the Sports Council, but I believe that there is another um, beneficiary of support which we can draw on to be able to help accelerate the installation of new lighting um, on the football field, and I will pursue that in earnest, because as I, as I said to you, putting together responses to helping communities become stronger, become more resilient, means that we must encourage as many young people as possible to actively participate in wholesome activity. Well, team captain Carl Gibson in his remarks recalled the team's road to the round of 16. I'm bringing forward to you as so far we are in to the quarterfinals. We won all five of our group games. We also won the um, round 16. The team is doing well on and off the field, training really hard. Even in the sun, while people are training at night, so it comes easy for us. I don't even give you information, but it's kind of easy for us at night when we are playing. Um, I want to thank the sponsors of Supreme Distribution for sponsoring the team. We are very grateful and thankful for that. Well, sales and marketing executive Rhea Juban told the ceremony the company's assistance is part of their social responsibility and wish the team well in the tournament. We know that Wahan FC is a team that has played very well so far. In fact, with their most recent match, winning 6-love, and we know that they will do the best going forward. And we hope that with our Vampire Malt, it, the pure and powerful malt coming in classic vanilla and coffee, that together we can push forward in this tournament and do an amazing job. That's our news. Good night and be good. Thanks for visiting us. To get more stories like this one, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.